Good morning, church. I'm so grateful for each one of you to join us today. And I'm so grateful for this time and this space to worship our God together, whose presence is exceeding the limitation of our physical distances. And I remember Jesus' promise that He is among us when two or three are gathered in His name. This is brand new day given us to love God and serve our neighbors and worship our God together. So let us come to God in gratitude and thanksgiving. Before we begin our worship, let me share some announcements with you. To stay connected, we offer virtual small groups and classes. Many small groups, including connect groups, Christian Roundtable, Woman's Bible Study, are gathering to weekly basis. And every Thursday morning, Pastor Chris offers a centering prayer at 8 o'clock, and Enneagram classes will begin by Pastor Chris soon. And every Wednesday morning at 10 o'clock, I offer Lectio Divina, the ancient practice of sacred reading. So if you are interested in or want to uh, stay connected with us, please email to our uh, office at headonfieldumc.org. And I sincerely appreciate your generosity for uh, Cherry Hill Food Pantry. We delivered over 1,900 items in total until last week. We continue to collect non-perishable items in a bridge way at the main entrance. Also, you can give monetary donations for those experiencing food insecurity in our community. Please use our online giving and select the Cherry Hill Food Pantry Fund when you give. Health professionals are in the front line and many hospitals experience the shortage of protect gears, including masks. So Mask to Mask Project is a fundraising uh, to donate resources to hospitals so that they can provide them professional masks for their employees. You can order fabric masks for your family or friends and help health professionals. The suggested donation is $10 per mask and 100% of your donation will go to hospitals for a special COVID fund to help cover the cost of masks and personal protective uh, equipment. Ruth, Ruth London and Jackie Williams are leading this project, so please contact them if you have any questions. You can actively serve and participate in online worship by reading scriptures or leading uh, on other worship orders. So if you and your family want to be a part of it, please email me at jyang at headonfieldumc.org. We are a church for such a time as this. This is a time of demanding needs and people need to hear good news. And our mission continues and ministry goes on. So I ask you to give generously as an active uh, act of worship this morning and as an expression of our gratitude to God. You can give online on our website or through the uh, HUMC app during or after service. Or you can mail a check to the church office. Throughout the week, we check our uh, church mailbox. So let's continue our worship with our whole heart, whole heart. Good morning, my friends. I hope that you and your family are doing well. It's a difficult time. It's challenging, and it's hard to believe it sometimes. But we know that God is with us because he is good all the time, and all the time God is good. So just remember that. And remember as we sing this morning, we're going to sing wherever I go. And we're also going to sing about how great our Lord is. Uh, we're going to end today's service with wherever I go. Don't be confused with the two different ones. And we're also going to hear an offertory from Miss Moselle Jules. We hope that you enjoy and please sing along with us.
When I was little, we had Pastor Mark from Magnolia United Methodist Church over for dinner, and my parents told him that they were teaching me how to pray. Of course, I wanted to pray for Barbie. My dad was quickly embarrassed by that, but Pastor Mark used it as an opportunity to tell us that our conversation with God changes as we age and go through life. Pastor Mark, God rest his soul, never could have predicted that we'd be in the middle of a quarantine during the year 2020. And who could have thought that we would rely on things such as Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram to keep in touch and maintain our fellowship and sense of community. I believe it is wholly appropriate when we praise and thank God to not only thank him for those heroes on the front lines, but to also thank him for the technology that helps us stick together and stand strong during this unprecedented time. Will you bow your head in prayer with me? Dear God, thank you so much for the artists who pour their heart and soul and passion into their work to keep us entertained during quarantine. Lord, thank you for those who invented platforms and apps that help us keep entertained and stay in touch with our friends and family. Lord, thank you so much for the heroes on the front lines, the doctors, the nurses, the custodians, the receptionists, those who stock our shelves, those who deliver the food. Lord, there are so many people to list. Thank you for each and every one of them. Thank you, Lord, for those who hold the hands of your children as they say their last breath, and for those who bring new life safely into this world. Thank you, God, for the ways that we're able to keep in touch. Thank you for virtual church. Thank you for Zoom calls. And thank you for our furry friends that help us when we have a low moment. Lord, we ask you to grant us peace as our mental health takes a toll during this quarantine. Lord, we ask that you protect us from COVID-19 and other evils and injustices in this world. And for those times when we do contract viruses of the body, the mind, and the spirit, we thank you for never leaving our side. Thank you, God, in this crazy world for being the sanity that we all need. And now we pray the prayer that you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Good morning. Our scripture reading today is from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 24, verses 13 through 35. Now on that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what are you discussing with each other while you walk along? They stood still looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered him, are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place there in these days? Yes, then what things? They replied, the things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, besides all this, it is now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some women of our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning. When they did not find his body there, they came back and told us that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see him. Then he said to them, Oh, how foolish you are, 
and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. As they came near the village to which they were going, he walked ahead as if he were going on. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, because it is almost evening, and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he, was, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, Were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? That same hour they got up and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven and their companions gathered together. They were saying, The Lord has risen indeed, and he has appeared to Simon. Then they told what happened on the road, and how he had been, and how he had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. This, this is, is the, the word, word of God, God for the, the people, people of God. God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Good morning. It is such a gift to be able to be with you, even if only virtually today. I'm uh, standing in an empty building. Uh, it's a little bit surreal. I'm live here with you. Uh, and it's just a powerful reminder that although the building is closed, the church is open. We continue to be connected uh, in new ways across technology and different platforms and across our different locations and spaces. I'm grateful for you today who have taken the time to worship with us and to tune in. I'm also grateful for all of the worship participants. You'll see that uh, that group is growing. People are offering prayers and uh, announcements and, and music and other things. And so for all of those folks and for anyone who would like to participate, I am grateful and I encourage you to reach out. Um, let's take a moment in prayer and then we're going to look at this story um, of the walk to Emmaus. Loving and gracious God, on this third Sunday of Easter, sometimes it is a bit challenging to be an Easter people when we feel confined, when we feel helpless and not in control. Oh God, but we pray that your resurrection will overpower any frustration or worry or fear that we may have. God, we pray that the power of your good news, of the gospel, the story of Jesus Christ, may permeate our situations, may permeate our hearts, may speak to us, and ultimately may speak through us. Today, O oh God, open our ears, our eyes, our minds, and our hearts to receive and embody your message. Through the power of the risen Christ, we pray. Amen. The new normal. This is a phrase that I've heard countless times in the past few weeks. And I hearken back to the first time I remember hearing that phrase, perhaps when it was coined. It was in the early days following the attacks of September 11th, 2001. And the nation and the world was trying to make sense of and recover from such senseless violence in New York City and Pennsylvania and in Washington, D.C. I remember very vividly living close to New York City. Um, the, the days just following September 11th, I took a friend to the airport. Her father was in failing health, and so she got on one of the very few flights leaving the Newark airport. And as we approached the airport, I remember seeing the billowing smoke still rising from the city in the distance. In the days to follow, we would slowly and eventually try to resume a rhythm of life. In some ways, an attempt to go back. But no matter how hard we tried, we realized that we were living in what people began to say, a new normal. The normal way of life on September 10th and the days prior to that were not accessible to us. Air travel was halted. Ways into New York City were still closed. People 
lived in fear and worry as to what might happen or the intention of the attacks and what might follow. There was, over months and even a year, a slowly phased back in reality. Little by little, work began again. People began to travel by air again. But no matter what we did, we were not living as in the normal as it was. It was a new normal. And while that new normal was fraught with grief and despair and fear and worry, there was also a kinder, gentler spirit, particularly in the New York area, where people had to come across oh, crossing boundaries that otherwise would have separated neighborhoods and people and classes and races and cultures. There was a kinder, gentler um, spirit in the air embracing our common humanity and wanting to be in community with each other. The new normal was painful because what had been was no longer accessible to us, but there was also a hidden gift in the new normal. There was a need and a desire for faith community, to pray, to sing, to be with one another. Today, we also are thinking about a new normal, and it's held in tension with a, a phrase that I've often used, which is our present reality, because a new normal acknowledges something that perhaps we're not ready to acknowledge, that, that there will not be a switch that gets flipped for us to return. So it's easier for perhaps, perhaps for us to just hold this moment in time, this shelter-in-place reality as a current reality. We're not ready yet to accept or embrace, perhaps, that a new normal lies just ahead for us. I think struggling with and processing the new normal was exactly what was happening on the road to Emmaus. In our story today, we're, we're two weeks after Easter, but it is, it, this story takes place on the same day that the women went to the tomb three days after Jesus' death. They went to the tomb and it was empty. On that same day, there were members of the Jesus movement. They were followers, but not of the 12 disciples. And they were leaving the city of Jerusalem in grief, in despair, and perhaps in fear. The road from Jerusalem to Emmaus was a seven-mile journey. And along that journey, they were naming their disappointment and their grief and their anguish. And uh, they were joined by a stranger who asked for clarity to understand why they were so grief-stricken or sad or disappointed. And they explained that they had put all of their hope, they had invested in this movement and in this prophet who taught powerfully, who healed people. They thought surely the one who was named salvation or Yeshua in, in the Hebrew and Aramaic, the one who was named salvation, they were certain would be their salvation, their political salvation, their religious salvation the one to restore them and their nation and their people to a new sense of peace and of righteousness in relationship to God. And now they were having to embrace the hard and harsh reality that that movement had come to an abrupt and violent end. Now, we don't know if their home was in uh, Emmaus. We know little details about those who were on the road. But what we know is that Jesus went to Jerusalem, like many people did, to celebrate the Passover. In those days, um, God was understood to, to dwell in the holy temple. So any religious festival or feast would be a time that people would make the, the pilgrimage to the holy temple in the city of David in Jerusalem. And there they would go to offer offerings and homage to God and even to celebrate the feast. And so it would have been common when the feast was over or when the, the holy day was over for them to return to their home. Perhaps these followers were there also for the festivities and for the holy um, celebration of the Passover. 
Or perhaps they were leaving out of fear of safety for themselves because they had participated in this movement of supporting Jesus the Nazarene. No matter what the story, they were on their way out. They were leaving. And as they talked to this stranger, they poured out their hearts and they shared of their anguish. But the stranger began to talk to them in a different kind of way and pointed out their sacred scriptures, the books of, the, of Moses, the law, the prophets, and even the writings. And he began to help them understand that perhaps what seemed like an end and perhaps what seemed like a tragic destruction of their hope could be seen in a different way. The stranger began to help them understand that on the other side of suffering and death can sometimes be renewed hope and even life. The stranger helped them to understand that perhaps the kind of leader they thought that they needed was not indeed the kind of leader that God granted them, but one that would surpass their needs and their expectations. When they reached the end of that seven-mile journey to Emmaus, the stranger was about to keep walking. And they invited him in for dinner. And as they sat and they broke bread, which is a, a religious ritual that would require a special blessing. After that blessing was offered and the bread was torn to be offered to each person at the table, then they knew. Then they knew that all along they had been in the presence of the one whom they thought they had lost. They could have never imagined in their wildest um, uh, imagination or expectations that Jesus of Nazareth would come and commune with them or would dine with them. And here, after sharing in their fear and their grief and walking together, Jesus was revealed to be with them in person. This painting is uh, one of my favorite depictions of that meal of uh, the Emmaus journey. It is uh, painted by Chinese artist He Qi, and um, it's, it's done in, in beautiful colors. You see that Christ is at the center of the table with a fish and a cup, and he's breaking bread. This is, this is not communion in the sacramental sense, but it is communion as they are communing together in spirit. And so while the new normal for those on the Emmaus journey involved walking and, and living with uncertainty and fear and sharing pain and grief, the new normal also offered an unexpected, powerful message of hope that, that new life was possible and that they were not alone. The Gospel of Luke is bookended by road trips. Uh, this concludes, there's just one little story after this in the Gospel of Luke, but this concludes Luke's story of Jesus of Nazareth, telling his story to the Roman governor Theophilus. The book begins with a road trip of Joseph and Mary to, um, to Bethlehem. And that trip is also one that's fraught with uncertainty and fear, and hardship, but they are driven with hope that Mary bears the one to be the Messiah. And here, this last road trip on the way out of a city, it begins with fear and disappointment that the Messiah wasn't all he was cracked up to be or thought to be, but it ends with those who are at the table having the power of incarnation, or they have the responsibility to then go forth, and this, the story ended today, that they went forward and proclaimed that Christ is not dead, Christ is risen. We thought everything was over, but the new normal involves a new future with hope. Today we continue um, in our alternate reality, a reality that most of us could have never expected or planned and certainly would not have welcomed or wanted for our lives. What we wouldn't give to sit at a table with each other, with our friends and our family, 
and break bread or to go to the things that we would want to do, concerts or gatherings, sporting events, school, church, whatever it may be. But we find ourselves out of, of protecting our own health and the well-being of those we love and of society in general, that we are facing this very different kind of reality, one that in many ways requires more work, but also has for us fewer distractions. And so uh, part of this new normal um, is a feeling of helplessness. In front of me, I'm looking at a painting of Jonah, and I'm reminded that right now feels like a Jonah moment when we are inside the belly of a fish and can't even flap our arms or scream uh, out of frustration. We feel confined. But just like in the story of Emmaus, the new normal presents not only uncertainties and fears, but a new, the new normal through our hope in Jesus Christ offers us the power and understanding that God can do a new thing. Hope is not dead. As I think of my life and our life collectively as a community, as a society prior to February, in many ways it feels that we were maintaining an untenable, tight string with the tension so tight and so strong that there was almost no room for self-care or for family care or to do the things that we needed. Perhaps you, like me, was very much, were very much looking forward to the summer where we could do recreational things and go places we wanted to go and to see people that otherwise we couldn't because our lives as we knew it were so jam-packed and so busy. And even the people we wanted to see, we weren't able to because we didn't have time. And so, in some ways, perhaps the previous normal was untenable and had its own limitations and challenges. And so now in this moment where we're forced to uh, be in community with people in new ways, perhaps we too are finding a kinder, kinder and gentler society where we are willing to lower some of the boundaries that divide us and where we are willing to intentionally engage people perhaps that we would not have before. I think there's a powerful opportunity for the church right now Prior to the uh, COVID-19 epidemic or pandemic, the church, I think, in general, the Christian church, was struggling to figure out its place in a new, more secular society. The church, in many ways, was struggling to be relevant and to figure out how to attract more people and to engage with younger people. And yet, the more we talked about it, in some, some ways, the less successful that we were. And now what is needed is not a shared gathering or a shared experience. But now what is needed, I think, is the same thing that was needed way back in the time of the Emmaus moment. The church began in a home with the breaking of bread and the presence of Christ. Today, the power of the gospel and the power of the church is not found in large in-person gatherings. And the truth is, it may not be in the months and even the year to come. Because even as we phase back into normal, we will be living in a new normal and not necessarily the usual or old normal that we expect. Even when restrictions are rolled back, certain people will not be willing to be put at risk, and many people should not put themselves in a place of risk. So we will have to adapt and to adjust our expectations but what we can learn from this moment is that what we need so deeply and, desperate and desperately in our lives is the very thing that sometimes our busied lives prevented us from having, which are authentic, intentional relationships. Jesus said to his disciples, where two or more are gathered, there I will be with you. Today, unless you're related to them or live in the same house, you shouldn't be gathering with two or more. But God's Spirit transcends time and space. God's Spirit connects us through technology and virtual ways. 
And so today, in this Emmaus moment, may we find what ways to seek communion. The church is not about a building or about music or about a shared experience. The church is primarily about relationships in which we are willing to be vulnerable and to show care and to listen and offer hospitality to one another and where we are able to open our minds and our understanding to perhaps see that in uncertainty and disappointment, perhaps God can do something new with it. So I think in the days and months and year ahead, let us find ways to seek authentic church, house church, virtual church. When we return to uh, a more busied or steadied life, let us not you lose the focus on communion. And perhaps communion in the future looks differently than communion in the past. But the new normal offers us a powerful gift, not just grief, not just disappointment, not just worry. But as bearers of Christ, we proclaim Christ has died, Christ is risen, and Christ will come again. My own name, Christopher, my, my full first name, means Christ bearer, coming from Christophorus. And I've often thought about what does it mean to be the bearer of Christ. In reality, Christians, we are all bearers of Christ so that as we face our own doubt and challenge, let us remember that we are not alone, but remember that we carry with us in our hearts and our DNA this preposterous message that God can overpower death, that love can drive out hate, and that, that, that light can overpower darkness. And as we live it out, as we engage in relationships with other, others, and as Christ is made known to us and revealed to us in those ways, we will realize that this message is not preposterous, but it is powerful and it offers us a future with hope. May God bless you and may we be the church in a hurting world, even if in new ways. Amen. Some mm -hmm.
Church is not a place to come, and Christianity is not a product to uh, consume, nor is it simply just a set of beliefs that we put in our mind. But our faith today is to be lived out, as always, first and foremost, in our relationships. We don't have to wait till we can gather again to reach out and to care. If you feel that there's nothing for you to do, you can pray for those who are affected by illness and those who are isolated and for those who have lost loved ones. If you want to do something but feel limited, send a card to someone, make a phone call, find ways to connect with others through technology. If you're not a part of a small group or a ministry or prayer, consider joining something so that we can uh, be connected through one another because in fellowship and in communion, by, by communing with one another, their Christ is revealed to us. I think one of the greatest challenges of this time is in isolation where all we see is ourselves, our own fears, our own wants, our own needs. Sometimes we lose sight of what God wants to do and can do through us. Let us not lose sight of that vision, but let us know that the church first and foremost is the gathering of the few, claiming hope and finding Christ there. So go, even if you can't leave your home, go in spirit and find a way to connect with others so that we may be the church for a hurting world, wherever there's pain and violence and despair and injustice, let us proclaim Christ's powerful message of release to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, good news to the oppressed. Let us go and be the church in a hurting world. Amen 
and God bless you. Right.